Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Electric Vehicles 101 webinar today. My name is Stephen Allman. I work for Forth, and I'm a program manager there, and I will be the host of today's webinar. Um, before we get started, I'm going to introduce some of our partners um, and do a little bit of background information about Forth. All right, so Forth is a nonprofit trade association. Um, we're focused in four main major areas, uh, industry, growth, and development. So we work with different OEMs, original manufacturers, to try to convince them to you know, go electric in the near future. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we work with uh, policy advocacy. So we have a lot of people lobbying for uh, more infrastructure to be built out for electric vehicles and for more friendly policies towards electric vehicles. Um, we also work with demonstration projects. Um, this can be in the form of, you know, a, an all electric car share. We have a couple of financing pilots for, um, or just one right now for um, electric vehicles for um, Uber and Lyft drivers, and then uh, consumer engagement. So we do events like this. Uh, without before COVID, we did a lot of in person events, um, but we do events like this uh, where we just talk to the public and try to answer questions about electric vehicles. All right, and. Here is a little bit more about Centralina, our awesome partner. Great, thanks, Stephen. So thank you all for being here today. My name is Karina Soriano, and I am the co-coordinator at the Centralina Clean Fields Coalition. And we're housed at the Centralina Regional Council in the Greater Charlotte region. So just a little bit about us. Um, the Clean Cities Program is a DOE established program fostering national economic, environmental, and energy security by working locally to advance affordable domestic transportation fuels, energy efficient mobility systems, and other fuel saving technologies and practices. Nearly 100 local coalitions serve as the foundation of the Clean Cities Program by working to cut petroleum use in communities across the country. About 80 per, 82, roughly 82% of the total US population lives inside clean cities communities across the country. Additionally, clean cities is responsible for saving nearly 8 billion gasoline gallon equivalents through the implementation of diverse transportation projects since 1993. Each coalition is led by an on-the-ground Clean Cities coordinator, such as myself, who tailors projects and activities to capitalize on the unique opportunities in the region. All coalitions do this through education and outreach around alternative and renewable forms of transportation fuel, infrastructure, technology, and vehicles. Each coalition varies slightly by the availability of fuel types and the interests of regional stakeholders. The biggest asset of the local coalition is the network and the stakeholders who make up that coalition. Clean City stakeholders through their coalitions have access to national labs, national fleet partners, as well as the connection that comes with other coordinators doing slightly different projects across the country. Coordinators serve as both educators and problem solvers for their stakeholders. We conduct a lot of education and outreach as well as provide technical assistance for fleets in our areas, building great local partnerships along the way. While primarily fleet focused, we um, coalitions also aim to educate the public and their local elected officials to help everyone make more informed decisions to lower their transportation costs and effects on the environment. So as you can see from the map here, North Carolina's Clean Cities coalitions are housed within councils of governments. So we have a unique regional view of program implementation and North Carolina is served by three coalitions. You'll see to the left, Land of Sky Clean Vehicles Coalition covers the, Ash the greater Asheville area and surrounding counties. Centralina Clean Fuels Coalition, my coalition, <laughs> covers the Charlotte metro area. And the Triangle Clean Cities Coalition covers the Raleigh-Durham capital area. And I've included the blue map to the right of the slide that breaks down our counties for the Centralina Coalition. While we don't geographically cover the whole state, 
We do all work with statewide and southeast regional partners to assist the rest of the state. So Clean Cities is the technology integration arm of the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. And Clean Cities are fuel neutral entities working to promote EPACT identified alternative fuels and deploy infrastructure. We can right size solutions for fleets and help stakeholders make the right decisions around transportation. And we work with fleets of all sizes from light to heavy duty. We also assist end users, such as yourself, with understanding mobility choices and new technology, such as micromobility, autonomous vehicle technologies, multi-unit development, among others. So for this project with Forth and the City of Charlotte, the core goal of the project aim to educate consumers around electric vehicles but also to acknowledge and deal with the issue of electric vehicle availability in North Carolina. Central Carolina and Forth have reached out to over 20 dealerships for this project to establish contact, inquire if they already have EV training for their salespeople, and offer additional training and partnership moving forward. We have also helped with establishing target audience groups, advertising and messaging, as well as establishing and continuing local connections. We've solicited input from external groups, organized the schedule, created and targeted pu key public groups to ensure they were aware of the webinars, and reached out to the several dealerships as mentioned above. Central Anna plans to continue working with these dealerships into the future to assist with dealership training if requested and partnerships for events such as ride and drives. So if you would like more information or to speak with a coordinator about your transportation options, uh, please visit the, Clean, the Central Anna <laughs> Clean Fuels Coalition website as listed on the slide there, or contact myself or my colleague, Jason Wager, for more information. Thanks. Thanks, Karina, and thank you to everyone joining this webinar. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the City of Charlotte's efforts and why we're doing this webinar. Uh, my name is Erica Ruane. I'm the City of Charlotte Sustainability Coordinator, and I think I'm trying to, I, I recognize some of the names here, but the resolution that we adopted in 2018 was the Sustainable and Resilient Charlotte by 2050 resolution, and this did three things. It set a goal for the city to fuel all fleet and facilities from zero carbon sources by 2030. It called for Charlotte to become a low carbon city by emitting less than two tons of CO2 equivalent per capita annually. And it requested a plan on how we were gonna reach those lofty goals. The CAP, the Strategic Energy Action Plan, is our plan for how to reach those goals. And this is focused on buildings and transportation transportation, which are the sectors with the, the most number of emissions. The CF transportation goals include electrifying our fleet and providing more sustainable modes of transportation like bike lanes and e-buses. Um, and currently we are trying to engage with the public and encourage the adoption of EVs. So we currently have uh, 40 stations with 72 ports of free charging available to the public. So anybody with an electric vehicle can charge at any one of these stations. And um, we, we, the city of Charlotte, picks up the tab for that. Um, at the same time that the CAP was being passed, which was December of 2018, we were announced as one of the winners of the American Cities Climate Challenge. This Bloomberg Philanthropies Challenge gave us resources to accelerate and strengthen the goals for um, our C app. So it focused as well on buildings and transportation. So this challenge supports our C app. The C app has 11 linked action areas. It has six that focus on municipal operations and five that are community wide. And action area eight, which I have taken out here on the slide, which is the to facilitate the rapid uptake of sustainable modes of transportation. Um, this 
action area, I'm sorry, uh, this action area has a task, task number two, which is to develop a, a promotion and awareness campaign around electric vehicles. And that is what we are doing today. Um, the American Today's Climate Challenge, the market transformation for EVs action area supports this work. So these webinars that we're putting on with 4th and Central Lina through the Climate Challenge will help create more electric vehicle accessibility and availability at local de dealerships and help to inform you all, the public, uh, about how you can have an electric vehicle that fits with your lives. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Erica and Karina. Okay. So both Erica and Karina kind of covered the um, goal of this, this program, but I'm going to go over it one more time. Um, you know, really, we, we saw that there was a need to get dealerships to, to keep more electric vehicle inventory available on their dealership, or dealership lots. Um, so if someone wanted to test drive one, they actually could at the dealership. Um, so that's one of the main goals of this program is to convince dealerships um, that keeping electric vehicles on their lots is worthwhile and it will get them sales because there is demand in um, North Carolina, specifically Charlotte. Uh, the second goal is, you know, we want to prove to these dealerships that people do really want to get behind the wheel. And, you know, so, so we want to uh, incentivize um, or we are incentivizing um, test drives. So if you know of someone who hasn't driven an EV before, I would highly encourage uh, you to tell them about this and you know possibly send them my my email and and send them to one of the dealerships that we've mentioned today um, that'd be super beneficial if you yourself haven't driven an ev i absolutely encourage you to do it um, it's a blast it's a really great experience and it's a lot better for the environment all right if you have any more questions about how to take advantage of this incentive uh, feel free to contact me um, or if there is a car that is not available like an electric vehicle that you want to test drive but it's not at one of the four dealerships that we have mentioned um, also shoot me an email and, and we'll work with you to try to find a way to get you in that vehicle well actually before we hop into this uh, we're going to take a quick poll question um, during this time and uh, so let's get it going so once you've answered the poll feel free to you know walk around freshen up your coffee whatever you gotta do All right, got a pretty good spread there. That's not bad. Um, let's see, do we have another poll question coming up or are we good to go ahead? There we go, thank you. I believe you have one more poll question after this, so sit tight everyone. And thank you for your answers. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for participating in that poll. It looks like we have quite a few uh, people that are already driving EVs, and at least one person said they were that their next vehicle will be electric. So that's fantastic to hear. All right. 
So for a lot of you, you guys are already aware, um, but you know, why should you care? You know, one of the main reasons is simply to cut down on emissions and to, to provide cleaner air for our communities. Um, not only that, but you can save hundreds or even thousands on fuel, depending on how much your average commute is. Um, electric vehicles have very little maintenance compared to internal combustion vehicles. Um, you know, they have about 75% less moving parts um, and components. So that just means a lot less things that could go wrong. Um, energy dollars staying local. So electric, electricity is produced domestically uh, and it's a lot less volatile. Um, that's part of the cost of ownership benefits. Um, you know, you may spend 10 cents per kilowatt hour, um, but that isn't going to change um, as rapidly as, as the cost of um, fuel uh, as in, you know, gasoline. Um, so supporting renewables, this is a huge, huge benefit to have electric vehicles um, because once there is vehicle to grid uh, technology and once that's implemented, um, I'll go over that a little bit later, that essentially allows the utility companies to store um, clean electric clean electricity through like renewable sources such as solar or wind um, in electric vehicles um, or large electric vehicles such as school buses. Um, also I skipped fighting climate change. Uh, transportation is the number one source of carbon dioxide um, emissions and as Centralina and the city mentioned um, you know they're doing a lot of great work to help fleets go electric that's that's one of the main things um, but we're also working with the public um, to try to get everyone to to start to think about considering an electric vehicle for the next car. All right, so just covering the different types of electric vehicles. Um, on the left, you see a Tesla Model 3, and on the right, you see a Mitsubishi Outlander uh, plug-in hybrid. So the Model 3 uh, is a completely electric vehicle. Um, you have to plug in and charge it. Um, other examples of, you can't you can't go to gas station essentially. Um, other pure electric vehicles can, or um, other examples of pure electric vehicles are like the Chevy Bolt. I'm sure you guys have seen Volkswagen e-Golf. Um, the Kia Soul has a pure electric version as well. So the Mitsubishi Outlander is actually a really cool plug-in hybrid. Um, it has a 12 uh, kilowatt hour battery, and depending on the size of the battery. That will actually scale how much of a federal tax credit you can get back um, for purchasing these vehicles. So there are both federal incentives for um, BEVs, battery electric vehicles, and um, PEVs, PHEVs, uh, plug-in hybrids. Um, that being said, Tesla and Chevy no longer qualify for their full federal tax credit. Um, there are several websites to, to help find those resources, and if you can't track those down, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. We'll also be sending these slides uh, to everyone at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions about the slides later, feel free to reach out. All right. So just going over some of the automaker commitments and kind of to see how the, the general industry is really pushing towards this, you can see that there's a lot of dollars being vested um, from some major companies, uh, Daimler, General Motors, Ford just made some huge announcements and they, they have plan to have a completely electric F-150, which is really exciting. Um, Hyundai and Nissan. Nissan is actually leading the charge for um, <clears throat> vehicle to grid technology, which is really exciting. Um, and the list goes on. And I don't know if anyone has seen it, but uh, Bentley has also claimed that they're going to go completely plug-based by uh, 2026. So that's pretty exciting, and that was in the news, I think, last week. All right, so this, this graphic will kind of help you understand how emissions work for electric vehicles. Um, your EV is only going to be as clean as the grid that you get your electricity from. So if you live in an area where there's a lot of renewables, um, in, in Charlotte, for example, you would be able to drive a lot, uh, or you'd have to have a really fuel efficient vehicle to be able to get, um, to create less emissions um, in a gasoline powered vehicle or hybrid, um, gasoline based hybrid, um, to create less emissions than an EV. Um, 
So this gives you an idea and, and really this helps us visualize why it's so important for us to clean up our grid and get more renewables. All right, so this is actually a really cool tool. Um, if you ever, the, the link is right here. Uh, I believe that will work on the slides. Um, the, if not, you can just Google source eGallon. Essentially, wherever you go, um, you can you can use this tool to figure out, hey, what am I going to be pay paying in you know gas versus electric? Um, and pretty much, actually, in every single state, electricity is cheaper than gasoline. And specifically in Charlotte, it is almost an entire dollar cheaper. All right. Um, oh, thank you, Simbi. So that link is in the attendee chat. Feel free to check it out. So EVs, as I mentioned, are a lot cheaper to maintain than gasoline vehicles. Um, on average, they cost about you know half as much to operate. That varies depending on how much you use your vehicle. Um, a lot of these things do, but there are no oil changes. There's no air filters, no timing belts, no fan belts, no spark plugs, um, all that wonderful stuff that you just don't need to deal with. And uh, I, I really appreciate that myself. Um, the 75% less moving parts, as I mentioned earlier, just makes it a lot less likely that something is going to go wrong, which is great. Um, for those of you who don't know about regenerative braking or haven't heard of it yet, um, electric vehicles have regenerative braking, which essentially takes the motor that propels the vehicle forward and spins it backwards, turning into a generator. Um, this not only can make it your vehicle a lot more efficient and help for long car rides, things like that, um, to, extract, to make your range last a little bit longer, but it makes your brake pads last about three times as long, too. Um, the reason being is because you can do what's called one pedal driving where as soon as you take your foot off the accelerator, the vehicle will come to a stop or, or begin to. Um, this limits the amount that you actually have to use your brake pads, and so they last much longer. All right, so there are a lot of financial savings um, with electric vehicles beyond cost of ownership. Um, the, the first one that I'll mention is the federal tax credit. Now, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, and... For Tesla and Chevy, this is no longer available because they have sold over 200,000 of their vehicles. But for other companies, um, actually every other car manufacturer that I've mentioned today and, and others that I haven't, uh, you know, Nissan, um, Hyundai, Ford, those are all, uh, they all qualify for the full 7,500 um, tax credit. There are also some utility rebates in Charlotte that, are, that may be worth taking advantage of. Um, Duke Energy offers a $1,000 rebate for qualifying level two home charging stations. So if any of you out there who do own an EV but don't have a level two station yet, this might be something to look into if you live in, um, live in Duke's, Duke Energy's service territory. All right. Um, also, pretty cool thing, um, you don't need to go in and get checked for emissions because there's no tailpipe. Um, and you also uh, can use the HOV lane if you have a pure electric vehicle or hydrogen-based vehicle as well. All right. Um, so this is actually a, it's supposed to be a GIF, but um, the uh, electric vehicles are actually a blast to drive. If you haven't driven one yet, um, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, they've got a lot of instant torque. The battery is really it's, it's low to the ground and heavy, so the, the wheels really uh, stick to the ground well and the corners really well. It's quiet um, and you feel really connected because it's like as soon as you press down the accelerator, you go. Um, my first experience in an electric vehicle was actually in a Nissan Leaf. And, you know, I didn't expect much and I was blown away. Uh, it, it, was, it had a lot more torque than I was expecting. So if you haven't driven one yet, I highly recommend it. All right. So what about the, the batteries from an you know, environmental standpoint? Um, so battery production creates less emissions than gasoline vehicles. Um, you know, this is due to essentially often, uh, or quite a bit of it is due to creating less uh, parts and components from the first place. Um, they're also a lot more, they're easier to recycle and uh, have more of a use in their afterlife. 
and they provide a really effective way to store energy. So a lot of off-grid um, you know, solar systems or things like that will store their energy through old or used Nissan LEAF batteries. And because of this, EVs are a lot less likely to end up in the landfill uh, than components of an internal combustion engine. You can reuse a, a battery a lot easier than you can reuse a gas tank. Um, and not to mention, there's also a lot of policies that, that try to for, forbid um, the waste of uh, the valuable resources within electric vehicle batteries. All right, so I mentioned earlier about vehicle to grid charging. Um, this is a huge opportunity uh, as far as limiting the amount of emissions that um, we create. So the idea here is that um, if there are enough EVs using in one uh, utility area, that the utility will be able to actually take energy and store it in these vehicles overnight um, or when the vehicle is not being used. And that will essentially allow the utility company to pull energy on demand from you know, these electric vehicles to go meet the demands um, elsewhere. So that, that cuts down on having to power up a gas generator or something like that or coal um, and really limits the uh, amount of um, emissions we create through our, our electricity grid. All right. So another thing that's really exciting about the re repurposing of these batteries is there's really a whole industry coming out of it. Um, these are all areas, this, this uh, visualization here, where um, electric vehicles or electric vehicle batteries are being reused. Um, and the list keeps growing. I actually saw the other day, um, the UK uh, has their first ferry that is completely run by Nissan Leaf batteries. Um, so there's a lot of really exciting developments um, happening going on here. Um, and I expect to see more out of this in the future when, when uh, electric vehicle batteries are a lot more accessible to these companies. All right, so actually in your vehicle, how long will this battery last and how much degradation should you expect? Um, it obviously varies quite a bit. If you see this graphic to the, to the right, um, you have a, a Nissan Leaf, a Chevy Bolt, and a Tesla Model X and S. So the main difference between the Nissan Leaf and the, the other three is that the Nissan Leaf is an air-cooled battery system, which is a little bit more outdated, but it's, it's really not a bad way of going. Um, but the, um, the Nissan Leaf does tend to see a little bit more uh, reduction in battery capacity um, and often, you know, this is because they are one of the older vehicles on the road and it, it varies depending on how much you fast charge or how much you use your vehicle in the first place. All right. So talking a little bit about EV range and what you can expect. Um, so this graphic to the right is about temperature. Um, and what's interesting about that <clears throat> is your EV will actually get, you know, optimal range um, in, you know, the span of you know, warmer weather or less hot weather. So it, it's really happy when the battery is not stressed out to either extreme. Um, so in an area like Charlotte, that probably doesn't have much effect, if any, on your, your battery right now. Um, but when it gets a little bit colder, um, you may see a slight reduction in your battery. Um, when it's really cold, I think the most I've ever seen is probably about 20%. And that one was when I was driving a Honda Clarity. Um, there's also some different things that affect the, uh, the range of the vehicle, such as, or such as uh, terrain um, or the, the speed you're traveling. So if you were to go on the highway, you would actually get a lot less um, range. It's, it's the reverse of an internal combustion vehicle. If you're driving in city, your vehicle's range would last a lot longer because you're using a lot less energy. Um, but to get to those high speeds and maintain those high speeds, um, it really puts a drain on the battery. Um, and the same thing can be said about steep terrain. Uh, kind of an interesting or an anecdotal thing to think about here is um, I try to get about three to four uh, miles per kilowatt hour when I'm driving on the highway, um, but from in the city, I average about five. So it's quite a bit more efficient. Um, 
and stop and go traffic is actually perfect for EVs. All right, so talking about the different plug types. Um, so everyone actually has the capability to charge an electric vehicle currently, as long as you have a 110 or 120 outlet, um, or you know that standard port. Um, oh, here's a little bit of a repeat. It is not the fastest way of charging, about three to five uh, miles per hour. Um, but this can be great if you are, you know, a pinch. Um, for me personally, I, I use this whenever I'm visiting family um, because my, my mom does not have a um, level two charging port. So this way makes it great. You just plug in overnight. Um, you may not get all the way up to 100%, but it, it, in my uh, experience, it's always charged up uh, plenty overnight and, and got me enough to get to where I need to go the next day. If you want to do that a little bit faster, um, man, if you have a typically, I recommend level two chargers for folks that have actually a larger battery capacity. Um, the Chevy Bolt has a 60 kilowatt hour battery. Um, that that's or Chevy Bolt, sorry, that's the vehicle that is to the right. Um, if you go on long trips, like let's say your commute is 50 miles uh, one way, so you go 100 miles a day, um, it would probably be you know less stressful to have a level two charger at home because then you'll be at 100% every morning um, when you start that commute. All right, so when it comes to fast charging, um, there's actually a lot of stations that are available in Charlotte for fast charging. And it's it's really handy and you know not something that people use all the, or rely on all the time. Um, but I do know a couple of people that live in multi-dwelling um, units such as apartments or condos where charging isn't available. And so they regularly stop by these um, fast charging stations just to fill up their, or charge up their vehicle um, and then come back maybe, you know, once or twice uh, every two weeks. So you can expect a lot faster charge out of these. Um, most of the time, by the time I, I plug in and, you know, go get lunch or get some coffee and come back, I'm at the range I need to be. Um, What's interesting about fast chargers is they they charge your vehicle really fast up to 80% and then they start to slow down. Uh, this is to kind of protect the battery and to also kind of make sure that all of the electricity is going in the right places and that the battery is going to be as healthy as possible. So the most efficient way to fast charge is to keep your vehicle between 20 and 80%. Um, and, and once you get to 80%, um, go ahead and unplug and keep going, unless you're going a long road trip and you need that full 100%. All right, so here's some charging stations that are actually available in Charlotte. Uh, I believe the, um, actually, I'm not sure. I can't tell which ones are fast charging from, fast charger stations from here. Um, it might be the orange ones, though. Either way, if you haven't been on PlugShare before, I guarantee, or I, I really, really recommend you go on and just kind of check out the different charging stations that are available in your area. Um, I saw at least a couple people said that they they didn't know of any charging stations that were, you know, close by that they could use. Uh, this is a great tool to to find out if there actually are stations. Um, I know when I first started driving electric vehicles, I was pretty shocked to find out how many chargers were right around my apartment. All right, so there are actually a lot of different uh, public or apps that help you find public charging stations. Um, and I think these are kind of like a phase, uh, in my opinion, you know, when it comes to when you think of driving a gasoline vehicle, you pretty much can see a gas station wherever. And I think that's the expectation that, that we should all have for the future of electric vehicles. Um, but for now, it's really handy to have these apps and to know exactly where you can go to charge. Um, I personally use uh, Charge Hub and Charge Way. Um, I like Charge Way for trip planning because you're able to actually pick out which chargers you're going to stop at along the way and figure out how long it will take you. So you can map out a whole electric vehicle road trip before you even go on it, which is, is really helpful and gives you a lot of peace of mind. Um, there's also a uh, website called A Better Route Planner um, that you can use for that as well. All right. 
So these are just two of the supercharging networks um, that exist in uh, America. And, and it's really kind of crazy to see how much infrastructure they've already built out. So Electrify America is the bottom one here. And essentially they've created fast charging stations that you can, so you can travel all over the US. Um, and there are a couple areas they're missing, but those areas do have charging stations. They probably just aren't Electrify America for whatever reason. Um, Tesla on the other hand goes everywhere. Um, if you can only use the Tesla charging network, if you have a Tesla or um, have what's called a Tesla tap, uh, it's essentially a converter for a um, J177 uh, plug to, I probably missed some <laughs> numbers or letters there, uh, but essentially it just converts that plug uh, or to the Tesla plug into a J177. Um, so you can use it to level two charge uh, a bolt or anything like that. Um, so that won't work at fast charging stations, but it can really help you out in a pinch. Um, and there's a lot of Tesla stations that are at hotels and things like that. Um, so if you have a Chevy Bolt um, or are interested in one, that's a great way for you to actually be able to take advantage of the, um, the Tesla charging network as well. But like I mentioned, these are only two of the existing um, charging or supercharger networks. So there, there are more than this. All right, so this is actually that tool I was talking about earlier, a better route planner. Um, this is really handy uh, to have. I, I pretty much always do this whenever I'm going on a road trip. Um, it, it's a lot less stressful if you know exactly where you're going to stop, where you're going to charge. Um, and it, it helps you kind of map it out in a way that's, um, that can make the, the experience more enjoyable. Like for me, I'll actually go through and I'll look at the different places you stop to charge and decide, hey, is that someplace I want to eat? Or, you know, is there a good walk there? Um, or potentially is there a running trail that I want to stop by? So that can be really handy, especially if you're going for a long road trip. All right, so we have two more poll questions that I think we're going to run now, and we'll get that going. Thank you all for your participation so far. Awesome. Thank you all for your responses and let's go to the next one. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, yeah. So the things we, we saw there in that last question is that the high upfront cost um, is definitely one of the biggest factors um, and availability, which is partially why we're doing this. Um, so I completely hear you all and let's, let's get going into talking about what, what vehicles are available. There's over 50 uh, electric vehicles that are available in the United States. Um, you may not be able to see them all at the dealerships uh, in your area, um, but it is possible to order these vehicles. So let's say you really like the Honda, uh, Hyundai Kona and you've, you've test drove it before, um, you know, when you're visiting one of your friends, um, you can always order those and have them delivered. It's just harder to, to get vehicles available for test drives. And, and that's partially what we're trying to work at here. 
or what we're trying to change. So one of the dealerships that's uh, volunteered to work with us is um, Hendrix um, Chevrolet. Um, they have a bunch of Chevy Bolts there. And Chevy Bolts is an awesome vehicle. It has a range of 200 and nearly 60 uh, electric miles. Um, I know a couple people that drive them in the city and get over 300. Um, and they are fairly expensive with a base as MSRP of 36,000. Um, 620. But uh, I would say I would recommend everyone to look into either used bolts or look into leasing a Chevy bolt. There's a lot of really great deals out there for this vehicle. Um, and if you were if you were interested in more specific deals, uh, feel free to shoot me an email and I can try to help track some of those down. All right. The other dealership that's uh, offered to work with us here is Planet Mitsubishi. They have a plug-in hybrid Outlander. They actually have three of them in stock. Um, as I mentioned before, this vehicle has a 12 kilowatt hour battery. That essentially means you can go about 27 to 28 miles on pure electric range, um, which is pretty handy. It also has the ability for you to plug in a uh, 110 outlet in the back. So you can actually use that battery as storage. So if you were going camping, um, you could you could have your battery completely charged up and use it to power your your phones or whatever you need. Um, twenty one kilowatt hours is or, or sorry twelve kilowatt hours is plenty to to charge up devices. Um, but that's another really cool vehicle. You can drive this in pure electric mode, as I mentioned. Um, and most of your most average trips that I saw from um, the uh, poll we took were under twenty miles. Um, maybe some of them close to 30, but this would allow you to do most of your driving on electric, but give you the flexibility of having, um, give you the flexibility to be able to use gas if you wanted to go on a road trip without having to stop to plug in. So the uh, Tesla Model 3, <clears throat> there's actually a couple uh, different models of Teslas now that are available at the Charlotte Matthews Tesla. Um, very cool vehicle if you haven't driven a Tesla before or been inside one. They're, they seem extremely futuristic. Um, I personally drove one two years ago. I think it was a performance model, and it, it knocked my socks off. It was, it was awesome. So very cool vehicles. Um, the Model 3 is, is the most uh, – sorry, I'll go back real quick. The Model 3 is at 35,000 um, MSRP. Unfortunately, Tesla doesn't qualify for the federal rebate anymore. Um, but there may be other incentives, um, so make sure you ask a Tesla representative if you go out and test drive. The Model Y recently came out. I haven't actually been inside one or even really seen one, um, but they seem very cool. Pretty much the same concept as the uh, Model 3, but with a little bit more um, room and a little bit more get up and go, depending on which model you get that is. And the Tesla Model X, which is the Tesla SUV. Um, it can fit, I believe, seven people in this this vehicle. Uh, I was I was told that uh, Elon Musk created this car because he ended up having triplets and decided, okay, we need to be more real realistic for those big families out there. All right, and some alternatives. And a lot of you mentioned that that high upfront cost was one of your biggest barriers. So. Um, this can be a great way of kind of or a great way to to break down those costs is is to look used. There's a lot of amazing deals um, when it comes to used vehicles. Um, and one thing you can do is is look online, have them delivered. Um, I know that uh, Erica uh, Ruan um, from the city actually purchased her vehicle through um, I think it was oh, can't remember what it's called now. Not Fleet Karma, that's something else. Um, it'll come to me in a second. Sorry about that. But these are really awesome. Um, Carvana, that's what it's called. It's literally on the screen. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but there are awesome ways to, to get a really great deal on an electric vehicle. Um, another thing, as I mentioned earlier, is to actually lease these vehicles. Um, if you maybe don't love everything that's out there, but want to drive electric for the next three years, you could lease a Chevy Bolt, um, and then wait until you see a car that you want to actually purchase. All right. So 
if you didn't see one of those vehicles, um, or when we talked about the dealerships, if you didn't see a vehicle there that you wanted to test drive, we wanted to throw out some alternatives to test driving or alternatives to going to the dealership um, to test drive. And one of those is, is Turo. Um, I, I went through uh, the Turo app in Charlotte, and essentially you can rent electric or you can rent vehicles, and one of the filters you can put on is for it to be electric. Um, there's a couple Teslas. There's a, a model, or a, there's a, a Nissan Leaf. Um, so if you're considering got, buying a used Nissan Leaf or a used Tesla, I'd highly recommend you know renting one of these cars for a day or even for a weekend. You know, go for going for a, a road trip and seeing what it's like to drive electric. Um, if you do this, and you can send me a photo of, of yourself with one of these vehicles and send it to my email, um, we will qualify you for the uh, a chance to win that hundred dollar Visa gift card. And tell your friends about this too. Uh, you know, if, if you have an EV um, and you want them to test drive it, uh, that would be fine as well. Just just make sure to send it to us. All right. Well, thank you so much. And if you have questions, if you have any questions, be sure to reach out. Um, I just want to do a final thank you to um, Centralina, uh, Centralina, our, our great partner, and um, the city of Charlotte, and the uh, NRDC, the National Resource Defense Council. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll open up to questions if anyone has any. Yeah, and all the presenters, if you could, uh, if you're able to turn on your, your camera, just so people know, um, I guess our names aren't are showing up here. But if you have questions specifically for Centralina, um, make sure to write them to Karina. If you have questions for Fourth or just about the program or how to get involved, um, you can ask myself. Um, or if you have any questions about this, what the city is doing um, beyond what they talked about, uh, feel free to enter that in the chat as well. All right. We'll wait a little bit longer, but if we don't have any questions, um, then perhaps we will wrap early. And as I mentioned, uh, we will be sending you all of these these slides. Um, so if you have questions that you don't think of now, you can always reach out to us later. How do I charge while renting uh, Turo or Get Around? That's a great question. Um, typically, what I have people do when they're renting um, Turo is, is before they actually get the vehicle is to download one of those charging apps. Um, and I'll give you an idea of where you can go um, to charge. Uh, and a lot of them take credit cards, so it's not like you have any memberships or anything like you have to have prior to that. Um, but it is a good idea to essentially maybe even map out a trip. And then uh, if you decide you know, you, you know where you want to go. Um, you could pull up one of those charging apps and actually plan that trip and see which stations you should you, sh you want to stop at um, along the way. And if you have any questions on that, I can send you some resources. Uh, like beyond that, I can send you, um, you know, the apps to download. Uh, Chargeway is one of them. Um, Charge Hub is another one. For charging for all personal use. So, yeah, the, the thing about it, the charging companies, they're owned and operated by different companies. So some of them go off of a membership model. Um, so it can be worth, like, looking into them ahead of time. Um, but, for example, Electrify America, that, that fast charging network that we showed earlier that's all across the nation, um, that one you can use a basic credit card for and you don't need to have any membership. Um, so in that instance, you can use all, your credit card for all personal charging. Battery capacity of old EVs. Yeah, so that's that varies. It depends on how much, a, a lot of factors. Um, it depends on whether it's liquid or air-cooled. Um, so essentially, if it's a Nissan Leaf or another vehicle such as a Chevy Bolt, um, the Nissan Leaf will likely have a little bit more degradation degradation. Um, it also depends a lot on how much someone has fast charged um, that vehicle. And 
this can vary, but um, for example, a, a, or a uh, 2013 Nissan Leaf, um, like one that's been severely, you know, let's say it's it was used for ride share or something where it's just constantly quick charging maybe three to four times a day. Um, vehicles like that, you'll see having a range of 40 to 50. Um, but when you look at like a Chevy Bolt or something that's been on the been on the road for the last three years, you'll see a very minimal degradation. Maybe like they'll lose like 20 to 30 miles at most. Yeah. So let's this let's skip. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I was going to say you go ahead. That applied to City of Charlotte. So uh, the City of Charlotte does not provide rebates for used EV purchases at this time. I think that that would be awesome, um, but we don't do that right now. Yeah, thanks for throwing that uh, warranty information um, in there, Mark uh, Williams. I really appreciate it. Uh, just an anecdotal um, thing from, from my experience is we actually leased one of the first Chevy Bolts um, that we could and ended up having a battery recall. And so we brought it back in and they did a full battery replacement um, in under a week. So I was really impressed by that. Um, and you, you've got a lot of, um, when you have an eight-year warranty and um, they give you that that guarantee that you're going to have 70% of that battery, uh, pretty much if it goes below 70 in eight years, then something's wrong with the battery and they'll replace it. Um, so you just want to make sure you have those warranties if it's one of the newer um, EVs. But uh, yeah, those, are, those give you a lot of peace of mind for sure. Um, so we had another question about the benefits of leasing versus owning. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of benefits for leases or for leasing EVs. Um, particularly, you know, you have less of a commitment. Um, you don't need to worry about things like, except ex for example, the battery health, because that vehicle is still owned um, by um, Chevy ultimately. And, and they would, uh, they would care about that when they get the lease back. Um, it's a good way to test out driving electric and then get an idea if that's really a direction you want to go um, and that it works for everything you need. We know we had a couple of um, EV owners come and speak on a panel earlier this Tuesday, and we'll be doing another one on the 19th. And a couple of those folks leased uh, a Chevy Volt until they decided that they wanted to purchase a Model 3 Tesla. So I can give you that peace of mind and let you kind of mull over the decision a little bit more. Let's see. Um, let's see, Karina, would you like to, you, you said you talk with, uh, you work with multi-unit dwelling um, units. Do you want to try to tackle that question? Yes, so we're actually doing a pilot project right now um, with actually this uh, city of Charlotte. So <laughs> Erica can also speak to this, um, where we are working on um, basically getting uh, charging stations installed on light poles. Um, since you've already got the existing, um, existing power, it's just being able to utilize it for charging as well. Um, presently, as far as city and utility rules, um, I can't necessarily speak to any particular building rules. Um, I know that things can get a little sticky depending upon um, who the property owner is and then who the um, who owns the the complex as well. So Erica, if you have anything else to jump in there, um, there's definitely opportunities to charge at apartments, and that's becoming a more common feature now. Um, but I know that there's still many that still don't have any yet or are looking into it for the future. Erica, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I, I mean, everything you said is is obviously correct. Uh, there aren't any there aren't any rules. Well, there are rules regulating, you know, the 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 charging stations, but they're really they, they relate to
to like the number of parking spaces that you have to have when you install a charging station because like it could potentially um you know like th that messes with your account so you have to make sure that there's still a number of the, the correct number of handicapped spaces um or just spaces per apartment complex because you know of the amount of units and stuff so there are some regulations there the city doesn't have anything i, I think that's the county um or sorry I, that is the county um but there aren't like rules saying that you know you can't have a charging station there because you can uh you just have to work within the constraints um and kind of switch some things around but if you are somebody who lives in a multifamily uh unit then i think that it would be really great to tell the developer or or the apartment complex you know that that this is something that would interest you because what we've heard from um from developers and and owners of of multi-unit dwellings is that they don't feel that that they need this. So I think that what we need to do is make it known that people do have electric vehicles and they would like to charge at home um, and that should be available to them. So I can I can respond to this one a little bit. So fleet companies. So I'm gonna I can speak to it with respect to city-owned fleet. So it's not really a company, but um, we have been approached by different organizations that have like turnkey operations uh, that include electric vehicles. So if we purchase um, electric vehicles and they can provide charging for us. Um, and they can provide, you know, like the, the data that we would want. And this is like a whole turnkey operation. Um, some organizations do also include the electric vehicles, but not that I've seen that are light duty. This is more when you're talking about like electric buses. So we can potentially lease an electric bus from them and, you know, per, like pay monthly or whatever uh, for for the purchase of those buses and then they include charging infrastructure that we don't have to own um, but i don't know about that for like personal use i can actually jump in a little bit here erica um since central Anna primarily deals with fleets so we work with both public and private uh fleet managers and so I can kind of speak to a little bit of the different perspectives. Um, they do typically benefit from EVs. Um, we are always, we always try and make sure that the fleets are right sizing and taking a look at their, um, their duty cycles for specific vehicles. So typically folks will, um, replace vehicles over time and so if they feel that it would be beneficial to have an alternative fuel-based vehicle such as an electric vehicle um, we're able to assist them with making sure that that's a right fit for them um, so for instance you may occasionally see uh, some of the uh, solid waste trucks that run around on compressed natural gas in that instance because they have a particular duty cycle. So there's a lot of um, short distances. So stopping between houses and then um, operating if they have like the side loader piece. So the arms that come out and take the trash and things like that, um, where that might wear too much on an electric battery, it works well for compressed natural gas. So we always try and make sure that any fleets that we work with are able to get the appropriate fuel for their usage. Um, but definitely uh, EVs are recommended for a lot of the light passenger duty things, such as Eric was talking about with the city of Charlotte. Uh, Mecklenburg County also has a lot of EVs in their, um, in their light duty fleet that they use just to take out and go around town uh, because they're not really needing to go too far and they're all domiciled at the same place. So they're able to charge at night or um, in between usage. So I hope, hope that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, when uh, big uh, electric semi trucks or buses become a lot more available, that more incentives become available or more grants become um, accessible for these companies. And that there'll, there'll be some, some really great ways to, to leverage 
um, those to, to benefit them if they go electric. Definitely. And there's several electric vehicle um, vehicle providers that are on uh, state contracts. So they basically have sort of the easy route into purchasing for um, state uses, as well as uh, the governor recently signed a medium heavy duty electric vehicle um, MOU. So memor- memorandum of understanding. Sorry, I have to remember not to talk in uh, <laughs> in acronyms, um, but that should hopefully kind of pave the way for more heavy duty um, electric vehicles to be seen on the roads as soon as we start getting more of them. I know right now, um, like Stephen was saying, there's a few a few available um, and they're just starting to come out. So they're still kind of expensive, but definitely within the next five to 10 years, I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot more on the roads. Absolutely. All right, well, we are at 10. So thank you all so much for for coming to this webinar. We really appreciate um, you being here today and then also answering the poll questions. Um, it's, it's been fun to spend this hour with you all. Um, huge thank you to Karina and Erica for um, being a part of the presentation as well. All right, well, have a great rest of your day and I will see you all later. Thank you.